Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Infrastructures Matters. I am your host, Kimberly Bates, today, and of course, I'm with my wonderful co-hosts, Kristen McComber and Steve Dickens. Um, as we go into some of this holiday week, well, Steve, it's not a holiday for you. You're Brit. We're, we're I don't celebrate my, sort of July 4th. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, somebody you, celebrate. Your That's dog, your dog. Your dog Apparently. Shows up. <laughs> the dog shows up. Right. <laughs> Let's keep rolling. The oh, dog's we're rolling. The we're rolling now. Okay. So, so welcome to Infrastructure Matters. I think we're at number 46, which I think is amazing. We've got some cool stuff to go talk about. Um, we're going to touch on security, which we always seem to do. We're going to touch on AI, which we also are seeming to it's do. 2024. we got to talk 2024. about 2024. And um, <laughs> something like that. So here we go. Um, the first thing that I wanted to bring up is that we were going to kind of wax on a bit more about Sovereign Cloud. And um, we keep on hearing a bunch of items about bringing out Sovereign Cloud. Um, where are the elements is I had an interesting conversation with Equinix this week that is not necessarily sovereign cloud, but it has to do with that. So I want to bring that up. It has to do with data, you know, and where you place your data and kind of stuff. So, but Stephen, I want to turn it over to you and kind of let you kind of bring up that topic. Yeah, so it's interesting. Oracle made some announcements this week, investing a billion dollars in um, data center capacity and new features in in uh, Spain. So you've heard me talk on this pod anybody who tracks my research notes knows I've been writing about this. You know, IBM investing in in Canada, AWS and Oracle investing in Japan, you know, Google investing, all of these guys are investing. And it seems to be the cost of investment is about a billion dollars. So that's the sort of kind of watermark that you get through all of these. The one that interested me, particularly in the Oracle announcements, was the reference to Dora. That's not Dora the Explorer. That's not Dora from a DevOps perspective. That's the Digital Operational Resiliency Act in Europe. This is Europe getting ahead like it did with GDPR, ahead of regulatory framework, which is going to bleed back into the US, and we're already seeing this. This is the concentration risk that the EU regulators are seeing of the smaller smaller countries collapse into a, something like an Equinix data center. And then what you see is you may have a multi-cloud strategy, but what you've got is a data center concentration risk. So I've, I've been tracking this um, with the UK banking regulators. They did some work probably two or three years ago now, which probably fed into Dora, but there's obviously a, a EU-UK split, but probably fed in. There's a couple of big Equinix data centers on the outskirts of London, and all the banks were putting their cloud infrastructure into those two data centers. Well, that's great that you've got infrastructure on, a on AWS, you've got infrastructure on Google, you've got infrastructure on Microsoft. But if a terrorist blows up the Equinix data center, it, your multi-cloud strategy means nothing. So... Dora is a set of regulations, and we've been working with the mainframe guys on this because they're obviously thinking about this most from a resiliency perspective, is a data strategy. Where do I put third copies of data? Where do I put immutable copies? So there's a, a backup and data protection component to this. But there's also an operation resiliency kind of mindset that the mainframe guys are obviously tuned into, but everybody else has got to think about where is the physical servers going to run? Where's the workload going to run? What's the um, sort of time objective and recovery point objective? How do I think through this? So it, it's kind of serverless is the, is the high level of we don't care about infrastructure. I hate that phrase because it always runs on a server somewhere. If you look at that, we've abstracted too far away with serverless. This is the EU going, we need you to get back to operational resilience. We need you to start thinking about this stuff because if it all goes bump in the middle of the night, stuff like banking's got to work. So it's really interesting. It's the first time I've seen one of these announcements around sovereign cloud 
specifically referenced Dora. There's obviously the geopolitical piece of, you know, uh, EU banks wanting their data in the EU and specifically Spanish banks wanting their data in Spain. You know, would would Santander be comfortable putting their data in Paris? I don't think so. Yes, they're all part of the EU and you guys all call it Europe, but these are very distinct. <laughs> <laughs> Spaniards don't don't speak French. French. No, no, no. I mean, unless you live in Andorra and you speak both, because you're up in the mountains in a ski resort. But I mean, all joking aside, the CIO of Santander is thinking very differently to the C CIO of Credit Agricole about where do they put their infrastructure, all while they're European. So I think that just plays into it as well. Very, very good. The um. I mean, and and that kind of the conversation that I had was not necessarily around sovereignty, as well. It was sovereignty. Sovereignty being I own my own data, kind of thing, as opposed well, that's to part sovereignty. of it. That's part of it. I think, as it's, opposed to the a, a, a country or that sort of thing. But we were talking about this concept of where data, and, and I'm going to move into the AI side of it, where data needs to move, where the compute needs to move close to the data. Well, I think yeah. that's the other component. You've got the country part of sovereignty, but you've got the data ownership sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys look after that space more, but that's the, there's kind of two angles to this very differently. Yeah, and the, the data being such a such gravity and, and weight as well as expensive to store in, as we're finding, in the cloud. So there's been a tendency to want to store it onto your own systems um, but then how do you deal with your own systems being able to, your own data being able to access, you know, AWS, Google, you know, Microsoft and, and flip, you know, flip between them. And, and that is one of the unique things that you had been tracking quite some time, but also was getting more or less an update about where things were on this with the Equinix kind of piece, where you're using that interconnect that Equinix has that allows you to, from an AI standpoint, stick that box right there with the data and be able to go and flex as a data scientist into any cloud that you want to go into. Um, and that's very, very powerful. Well, um, I think the, the, the key for me, and we keep saying this phrase, move the AI to the data, not the data to the AI. And I think, you know, this is why I'm seeing Oracle doing so well with its cloud at customer and its exadata and its exascale connectivity to OCI, where I see those guys, they made some heat wave announcements today, Ron, uh, sorry, this week, Ron covered those. I think there's just a general trend. You know, this is bringing Vector and other capabilities into the classic sort of Oracle portfolio. People are going to be bringing AI to the data, not vice versa. You know, so whether that's the physical location of the data, whether that's which database the data's in, what the services that connects to it, you know, there's lots of things to unpack around that piece, but data ingress and egress fees are huge. I'm not going to go and move my multi terabyte, multi petabyte data store off prem into the public cloud just to connect an LLM to it. It's going to cost a small fortune. And Krista, you know this better than I do a whole bunch of other data management and security problems Absolutely. when you move that data. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. And, I, mean, uh, how are you, I mean, it's interesting. I pivoted to you there. How are you seeing that from a sort of data protection, data management, data security perspective? Yeah. I mean, I would agree, Stephen, with, you know, all the comments from, from you and Kimberly and, um, you know, just kind of going back to your initial comments. I love, I actually really do love kind of talking about, resiliency um because that's that's really what it's about you're right? a partner kind of... in crime with me on this topic <laughs> you? right it. <laughs> it's it's interesting you know a lot of the data protection companies are really leaning into that message and i think it's for a good reason right because it's about um you know not only kind of inhibiting the attackers from getting in um but also you know kind of minimizing the impact in terms of data loss and downtime and so it's interesting because regulations like Dora, they're sort of almost kind of providing a framework for companies when we think about resiliency, right? So it's almost kind of like setting the stage for kind of what the best practices are. Mm -hmm. um, 
And another component that you were alluding to was it is not just about the technology, but it's about the processes as well, right? So it's about, okay, making sure that we all have, you know, our plan in place for what our individual roles are, you know, when a recovery, um, when a cyber incident occurs and when we need to recover. Um, and I'll just kind of add as well, you know, you touched on, um, you know, basically your service levels for recovery point objective, recovery time objective, how long are you down? How much of your data loss? And um, what's tricky is that it's, in many cases, it's best efforts. I mean, we've been talking about this for years now in the context of these, these cyber attacks because they all look and act a little bit different and it's going to depend on what exactly, you know, was impacted. So it's um, almost, you know, not completely upending, but it's certainly, I would say, when we think about data protection, disaster recovery, it's really kind of changed the game. And I would say it's really kind of changed how we think about, um, you know, how, how we think about it, really. Yeah. It, I mean, it's almost as if there needs to be a podcast that describes how infrastructure matters. Yeah. <laughs> so then when I was tying the pieces together, we, we started talking sovereignty, which is sovereignty was all about where the data resides. We started talking about AI, this AI issues about moving the compute to where that is talking about resiliency and recoverability. And it's about where, where we're doing, you know, where the data is. And then we're finally, you know, getting into that point of, of <clears throat> cybersecurity, et cetera, and how all this is tying around. Maybe it should, data matters, not infrastructure. Oh, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I can feel a sister podcast coming on. Later, later, later. <laughs> Okay, so, so I mean, which builds me I into it. where you were going with that then for a moment. I can see the brain, your, your wheels turning. Okay, so here's the next one. So here, so I know this week we had um, some briefing calls with Cohesity. Some of the stuff is, is you know, roadmap work that we're working, we're talking with them about. But some of it is current on the Gaia. Ga Gaia? Gaia. Mm -hmm. I, I keep saying Gaia because we have this this, this company here in Boulder that pronounces it that way. That's Gaia. <laughs> um, so Gaia and, and what they're doing with that, which has all to do with data classification and visibility, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, all, I mean, it's kind of interesting how, you know, you got Oracle and the Sovereign Cloud as we're in placing things, but they're all a little tied together about data matters. <laughs> right? <laughs> Go ahead, Krista. Sure. Yeah. And kind of to your, your point, Kimberly, um, you know, we can't talk much in specifics because a lot of it really kind of was forward looking. But um, it's I think I is a very interesting use case um, because um, right off the bat, Cohesity um, has really been leading into retrieval, retrieval augmented generation rag um, to you know, really kind of enhance the context of the insights that it is returning back to the user by using Cohesity Gaia. Um, so we really sort of had a great conversation with them um, sort of regarding, um, again, some of their future plans, um, but also um, really just some of the security considerations when we think about using a tool like Gaia, um, because there really are, there are two sides of the coin. You know, of course, there's the ability to use AI to, um, you know, enhance operations on a daily basis, but then there's also the ability to use Gaia um, or other AI tools in general um, for kind of more of a chatbot assistant type feature. Um, and to your point, Kimberly, when we think about the fact that it is really kind of aligned around the data classification, the ability to return for highly contextual insights, you know, I would say the, the data privacy is always a concern with AI. So how do I make sure that I have the proper, um, you know, access controls and things of that nature in place to make sure that I, uh, as a user, I'm not able to access sensitive, you know, or compliance data that I'm not supposed to access, right? So we did, we have certainly kind of leaned into them on some of those conversations as well. Um, and again, a lot kind of coming in the roadmap, um, but we, you know, certainly there's a lot of conversations we're having kind of in those areas these days. Okay. So continuing on our two themes, um, <laughs> and talking about AI infrastructure, you're going to uh, 
Steve, you're going to talk a little bit about AI infrastructure and kind of expouse on a little bit of what we're seeing with this Lenovo or maybe HPE kind of space kind of stuff that's going on. Yeah, so we covered Discover last week from HPE. I've been spending a whole bunch of time with uh, Lenovo this week with their what they're calling AI for all campaign and trying to dig into the details. I think, I mean, it's more, it's nothing specific around a particular announcement. It's just what I see sort of an industry trend. I was chatting to one of the press about um, specifically Lenovo and what they're doing and some of their announcements. I think for me, it's curation. It's around people not knowing where to start. It's, I know I've got to do something, but I don't know what that something is. You know, Lenovo's doing a great job of pulling together 165 different applications in its in, um, AI Innovators program. HP is doing a really good job with its uh, uh, private cloud for AI kind of T-shirt size models. I think if we sort of speak to enterprise architects, as we do, they know they've got to do something, but they, and they know they've got to do it fast. I mean, it's interesting, Lenovo even calls its services fast start. So I think there's this whole sort of piece, and as I say, there's nothing specifically from an announcement point of view. It's, it's more around where is the market right now? I think we've, from a sort of maturity point of view, we've gone past the do I need to do something phase, and we're now into I need to, I know I need to do something, what is that something and how do I get started fast? And I think that from the vendors, and you're better plugged into Dell than I am, but I'm certainly seeing that from HPE and Lenovo. Are you seeing it on the storage side, Campbell? Well, I, I think we're already, we're a little bit beyond even slightly where you are. They've already, many of the companies have already started on the initial pieces and you know, the easiest place to start, of course, we've talked about this before, is in programming and in, 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 uh, quote coding. Um, so they've gone there and that, now they're getting their experiments experiments up and we're seeing maybe some of the chatbots not performing the way they want to. So they're having to go back to and retrain, regroup, re whatever. And we're, we're at that stage of starting to learn the limitations, learn the requirements, learn how do you build and how you bring up. And so we're seeing some of those first guys getting out there. Within that, um, you know, the, the other people that are coming up behind them are saying, how fast can I move on that infrastructure? And that's why we're seeing these companies, whether it's Oracle, HPE, Lenovo, Dell, you know, and, and even NetApp, you know, the storage people are bringing systems together and, and um, that can deploy quicker um, than if I built up my own, my own system myself. Um, and so even even Equinix is talk, you know talks about what they're trying to bring to market in terms of the AI solutions that are in the market. So it is a overall that infrastructure piece of it is how do I make that easier? And heck, we saw this back when we, we were putting up the web, websites for the first time in 2000, right? Websites were very difficult to put up to a certain extent at that point in time. So once we could you know containerize it or put it in a box and ship it, ship it out, then all of a sudden we could see the proliferation of, you know, e-commerce, et cetera. That was everything that we all scratched our heads about at the point in time, but then, then exploded from that point on. So well, yeah. it's interesting. You mentioned chatbots there. I spent some time with the team at five, nine, they're a contact center company. I stay connected to these guys because obviously the cloud infrastructure piece is where we spend the majority of our time and Keith Kirkpatrick on our, our team, focuses on the um, software as a service guys, but I stay connected to 5.9. It's really interesting. As we talk about sort of use cases for AI, one of those is in the call center. I think it's now in my top three of like most obvious things you should go do. You should be using AI for developers. You should be using AI for chatbots. You should be using it in your call center. But the, the conversation I had with those guys was really fascinating. There's kind of two perspectives in the market and it plays into the sort of is AI killing jobs kind of high level narrative that we hear in the market I don't see it that way at all and I don't see it that way in the call center I see it in a in a way of those call center teams all of us call into call centers I had a fantastic experience with United that I posted on X about you know we're all looking for that moment where 
amazing service. You know, this person saved me 1500 bucks on a flight to Japan. She was fantastic giving us advice about um, how to connect from various airports. And it was, a, it was just an amazing case study of experience. Kudos to the Premier One K team at United. But I see it as an ability to unlock. And this was the whole conversation with Five Nine. It's a cheat code, it unlocks a 30 to 50% productivity. I think the smartest organizations are going to look at that unlocking of AI productivity and go, I could do two things. I could reduce the number of people in my call center by 30 to 50%, or I can increase the service, reduce wait times, unlock that premier service piece, that project I've always wanted to do, or do some innovation in the call center. And I think the smart organizations are going to do the latter not take the reduction. So it was a fascinating, I mean, I don't spend much time in the call center space, but it was fascinating for me, the briefing and the discussion we had around kind of how the, the downstream effect of the work we're doing at an infrastructure level is finding its way through into the call center and how there's an opportunity to innovate, add value, improve service, and do all those things using this technology. Well, one of the, if you look at call centers, one of the big things about call centers is turnover, right? You have, depending upon the kind of call center call center you have, you could probably have over 120% or more turnover leader. So you, you, if what I can do is make it call center operations more tenable, more engaging, more I'm assisting, and I can have more of a reward of what, what my work is, which is what happens when somebody helps somebody else. Whenever we're helping somebody else, we get all the kudos back to ourselves yeah. about good about something that we've done for somebody. And, and that goes up. So from a call center person, if I am able to do that, and that call center person or whoever that service person is able to streamline the systems that they're having to navigate, which often they are having to navigate some, some mm -hmm. spooky stuff. Um, this is how this works. I mean, especially when you're talking to, you know, an airline agent and kind of like, and she's going through this system and this system, and let me look at this. <laughs> it's like, God, God forbid what she's working on in front of her or she, he, um, I shouldn't just say, say a single gender here. Um, but yeah, so the easier that we make that, the more streamlined and more information we can give people to make their own decisions, they feel like they're more in control of the life and they're bringing more value back to the people. And that's what makes those jobs important and, and meaningful. I hadn't thought of it from the actual agent. I was thinking of it from the consumer, but you make a really good point there, Kimberly. It, it is, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, job satisfaction kind of situation and i think that is really super important which in turn will help the end consumer be happier as well right virtuous circle right exactly absolutely that you have exactly to yeah so let's see what else we've got on our list here we um talked about but well, there's one okay so we, we, we weren't going to talk about this but i think it's kind of a cool discussion um and that was the penetration testing kind of conversation that you had which is I think still goes into this discussion we're having from a sovereign cloud and all that kind of thing, because we're, this is the black hat, white hat kind of thing that's going on, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so this particular conversation, um, it was a, with a company called Fortra. Um, as I'm kind of expanding my coverage of cybersecurity, I'm definitely broadening the companies I work with. And um, for a company like Fortra, they play in many areas of the security market. So I've been trying to chunk off pieces and have conversations um, in, in specific areas. Um, and um, so they kind of gave me an overview of their solution um, and they support, and I have kind of my notes over here if I'm, if I'm glancing over, um, but they support effectively, um, you know, kind of two components, um, one being vulnerability validation and the other being sort of your more standard penetration testing, um, you know, the ability to identify attacks and kind of, you know, attempt that brute force, um, you know, that brute force attack there. Um, the stat that really um, stood out with me is, so going back to the discussion we were having at the start around compliance, um, they did say that they're supporting that for audits and they have customers that will maybe one year um, kind of do their penetration for testing for their audit in-house. 
and then outsource it the next year. And so they think they're in good shape. Um, but they said for one client, they did not disclose who it was, um, but Fortra identified about approximately 300 credentials that were compromised and approximately one third of those were admin related. Um, that was a bad morning for the CIO to get that report. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Jeez, that's right? Bad. So yes, um, so that was really the stat that I kind of walked away with. And I think it's just, it's staggering. You know, you think you're in good shape, um, but the threat landscape is evolving so quickly. And in particular, the fact that one third of those were admin related, I mean, that's what we're seeing attackers are focusing on today. They're focusing on those legitimate credentials, trying to log in versus hack in. Um, and that's how they're really looking to gain access to critical infrastructure. So, um, you know, it's definitely, it was a very interesting conversation and I think really kind of, you know, hit the nail on the head in terms of a lot of the, the critical issues that we're seeing in a, from a security perspective these days. Yeah. Okay, well, that wraps another day. Thank you very, very much for tuning in. Thank you, Steve and Krista. This has been a great conversation this morning. Don't forget to click and like and pass on and share and all those things that you're supposed to do with our with our incredible podcast. And we thank you very, very much for tuning in because, you know, we've got a super great following. So it's, it's very rewarding to be able to do this. Have a great day. Thank you.